Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> I've mostly done. No, he, oh, no, he has nothing to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, but uh, oh. <laughs> you have, you have to go to go Hello? 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 Delighted to be here with everybody today. <laughs> How is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Right then, hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy at Astro Camp. And we have the Astro Campers with us. Everyone give us a big cheer! <laughs> a rowdy lot. Look at them. Uh, and they look a bit tired and they do look a bit cold. Have you thawed out yet? No, no, it was very good. It's probably the coldest we have ever had at Astro Camp last Definitely. night. Minus it? seven, I heard from one <laughs> of the residents. Seven. Minus seven last Minus night, seven. it got to. That's what one of the residents said. I gave up at two o'clock when my secondary mirror froze. <laughs> <laughs> it got that cold. I gave up at half past one because I was Messier marathoning. So trying to see as many of the Messier catalogue over the weekend of Astro Camp. And it got to half one. We done sixty seven or so. Well, we had to wait until about three o'clock for the yeah, next lot of gap, constellations to rise, yeah. and we just were like, "No, it's no. cold. Go to bed." That was the most impressive, well organised Messier marathon I've ever seen. You were like, "Has everybody seen it?" Bam, move on to the next one. Right, oh. this, is, this is what we're going to do now. This is the next one. This is what we're seeing. Everyone's yep. seen it. Next one. You, yeah. you were like, like, "You look, look." You were like a tour guide no. at the top of the common. He's like, yeah. need an umbrella. Like, run yeah. M M30. Come on, look, M30. Look, yeah. M31. There we go. I know. <laughs> As I say, it's follow the wobbly red light. <laughs> <laughs> so, did everyone? Everyone had a good time. Did everyone, everyone. Yes, excellent. Right. So we're going to open the floor to some questions from you guys, and we're going to we're going to discuss, and you guys join in. So we're discussing anything about space, astronomy, whatever. It's over we've to got you a guys. question over there. So, to wait, to wait, I will come over. I will come over and wave my microphone in your face. <laughs> Look at that. That's not an offer you get every day. What are you most excited about in terms of the potential of the James Webb Space Telescope? Oh, very oh. good question. For me, it's absolutely seeing the very first stars and galaxies because we don't know how the first stars form. So stars form from clouds of, of gas and dust in space. And in order for those gas clouds to be able to collapse, you require dust grains in order to absorb some of the heat and allow them to collapse. But... Mm. In the very early universe, there is no dust because dust is formed during the lives and the deaths of stars. And of course, the very first stars, there's been nothing before them. So we really don't understand how these first stars form just from clouds of hydrogen, helium and a little bit of lithium. It's how do we get that hydrogen into molecular hydrogen and we need the dust grains for that. So I'm really excited to see those because that's a really, really big question. So that's sort of 400 million years after the Big Bang or so. That's what it is for me. I think for me it's got to be the exoplanet potential. We've got absolutely nothing around at the moment that can peer into uh, exoplanet atmospheres. These planets that are just so many, uh, so just so distant from us. Um, the, the closest ones, I think, well, we've, we've got uh, Alpha Centaur, Proxima Centauri IA that's around four light years away. But the majority of the, the planets that we're going to be looking at are tens, if not hundreds or thousands of light years away. And being able to peer into those atmospheres and take a look at the spectra of those atmospheres to understand what chemistry is in there, mm -hmm. to hopefully give us those clues, give us those biomarkers that we're looking for, signatures of potential life on that planet. So what we're really looking for is things that couldn't be created by geological processes. And if we can get signatures of those, or even at the extreme, and I don't think by any chance this will happen, but if we could get any evidence of industrial chemicals, then you know, you've almost yeah. then, you've got a surefire, there is industrial life on that planet. Can you imagine? Uh, that would just be incredible, but we just don't know. It is that voyage yeah. of unknown yeah. with JWST, isn't it? Yeah. What they said. 
<laughs> no, uh, although I'm going to I'm going to caveat with actually what I'm looking forward to is just the flipping thing working. <laughs> um, I I I one of the, the kind of background jokes in in the podcast is that I am bored of the James <laughs> Webb Telescope. Yeah. I am so bored of talking about this telescope. We've been talking about this telescope forever. I feel I feel like I was talking about it when I was born. <laughs> um, it's been around so long and we've waited so long for this thing to, to actually get into space um, so actually I'm, I'm a little bit kind of jaded with it oh more James Webb um, yeah just just I'm looking forward to it working and the science coming out of it after all these years of waiting um, and almost like anything that it delivers is going to be exciting I think so um, and absolutely I echo both what these guys said the, 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 the exoplanet one is the one I'm I mean I know you're dust you're, you're dust dust, <laughs> dust. dust. Um, the, the exoplanet thing is actually what I'm really excited about because it's that it, we're going to answer that question. You just yeah. you just feel like that question is going to be answered in the next few years, and James Webb is going to be part of the the fleet of these big telescopes that are coming online over the next decade that will answer that question of are we alone? And we're going to get that answer. Yeah, because we're moving away from mass discovery of exoplanets to yeah. now understanding them. You know, yeah. we've got yeah. Ariel coming online in a few years. That's going to be characterising atmospheres. There's Cheops, isn't there? Or yeah. Cheops, however you want to say it. Again, that's characterising, not discovering. So, yeah, it's yeah. the right time to be an exoplanet. Yeah, we've got over 5,000 exoplanets now. So and that's just the confirmed ones. Yeah, not yeah. so you, you, you know, feel there's like... There's loads more candidates. You feel like, yeah, there's loads more to come still. And within that, there's going to be, it's got to be one. There's going to be at least one of those that, yeah. that will go ping. And I think more than anything else, you know, the, the cosmology side of James Webb with what we can learn going back in time and how the universe formed and how galaxies and, and, uh, and stars formed in the early days, that's huge for cosmology. But I think that there's something that's more, um, uh, it's just bigger on a human level. Mm. If we detect life out there, it's just, life changes yeah. forever for us. Yeah. And and that's exciting or scary, depending on how you look at it. It's paradigm changing, isn't it? Yeah. Like, completely. Yeah, completely. Right, who's got another question? Right, we've got, we've got a question over here. I should come over, hang on. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. I read that sparse arms are produced by interactions between galaxies. Did the Milky Way and the Andromeda f form each other's spiral arms? That's a great question. And I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, looking at me. Okay, so um, galaxies colliding are really interesting because galaxies themselves are actually really, really not very dense at all. So if you imagine all of the stars in a galaxy and you've got these two galaxies heading towards each other, it's like two swarms of bees colliding. Only imagine between each bee you've got two moons. That's the sort of distances between stars. So when they collide, they, it's not this great big explosion because they're not very dense at all. But what you can get is you get gas clouds colliding within these galaxies. And those collisions of those gas clouds can spark the formation of new stars. Because we need something to trigger these gas clouds to collapse through gravity. And collisions is one way that that can happen. Within galaxies, again, you can have uh, the explosions during the deaths of stars that can trigger new stars. But then as these galaxies are colliding, you can get stars and gas flung out in all these kamikaze orbits. And it's really dramatic. But yeah, colliding galaxies, it does produce beautiful bursts of star formation. And then quite often, once those galaxies have collided, it kind of uses up all of the star forming gas in these galaxies. And so then there's nothing left to form future generations of stars. And so then we, instead of having these beautiful spiral galaxies, we end up with elliptical galaxies, which are these big sort of footballs or rugby balls full of stars. And that's the sort of way that, that galaxy evolution goes. But Andromeda and the Milky Way, they're still two separate galaxies at the minute. So they've got their own spiral arms. But yeah, eventually, about five billion years or so, they're going to come together beautiful bursts of star formation, more stars than we can imagine in the sky, and then it'll just be nothing, really, by and large. Uh, spiral arms are really weird, though, aren't they? Because they, we don't know why they form. That, that's that's yeah. actually one of the great sort of galactic mysteries, isn't it? Exactly why spiral arms form. And they don't work how you imagine. It's one of the, the strange things to explain about galaxies. Is the, you, you expect the arm to actually be the thing that's moving around, but it isn't. The arm is, is a sort of it's almost like a traffic jam. You know that, that bit where you're going down the motorway 
and the traffic all slows down at a point, and you crawl through a little bit of traffic, and then suddenly you whiz out the other end. That's what a spiral arm is. It it's actually a concentration where the the stars are, are in orbit around the galaxy, and then they sort of bunch up, and then they they sort of move apart again. So the the arms don't actually move as such um, in in that way that you imagine that they're they're kind of you know the arms would sort of spin around like a circular saw. It doesn't work like that. The stars orbit and go in and out of the arms. So currently the our star is is in a particular arm. It's in the the Orion spur. But it won't always be in that, and it will move out of it, and then it will move into another arm, and it will it will move around. It goes round um, the galaxy about two hundred million years, and it's been in sort of various arms. It's moved round, so it doesn't work like we do. Not quite sure why they form, do they? It's sort of it's it's a really weird thing. Yeah, it's almost like a like a pressure wave moving around the galaxy, like um, like when a, a ripple moves through water, it's it's the ripple that's moving rather than the water itself. You're getting that, you know, the the wave propagates through the water, but the water is sort of just moving up and down, as it were. And it's it's something like that. But yeah, the formation and evolution of spiral arms are hotly contested. There's lots and lots of theories out there to explain them. They are weird ones. Yeah, and the the, the idea that the sort of galaxies that have passed near each other, I think, it is one of those theories, that idea that something, something a larger mass has come past and, and kind of stirred up the, the, the wave, that is one of the, the theories sort of bound. But nobody knows. We don't know yet. Um, and that, that's a big thing for investigating. That's one of the things that Gaia's looking at, um, is like kind of how the galaxy works. That's one of the things Gaia's kind of doing, which is one of the, those kind of unsung probes that's working away in the background and, and really going to change astronomy over the next few years as the, the data is analysed. Yeah, because Gaia is tracking a billion stars in our galaxy, really precisely measuring their positions, their motions, and it's just mm. going to unveil so much yeah. about the Milky Way. And, w and one of the really great things is that when you're looking up in the sky through a telescope, like we've all been doing over this weekend, is that you're seeing individual galaxies as a snapshot in time. And because they're all millions of light years away, They've all gone through a different stage of evolution now as, as they are in the sky. We just see them as, as they were um, that time ago. And, of course, with M51 that we all saw, I, th I assume we all saw last night, you know, you can see that the, the start of those galaxies starting to merge, and it's just wonderful being able to see that with our own eyes, with amateur telescopes that we couldn't have dreamt of as amateurs, you know, 100, 200 years ago. Oh, can you imagine what Messier would have done if he saw some of the telescopes out here last night? My the Messier catalogue would be thousands, wouldn't it? It'd be, it's the, it'd be the NGC. <laughs> it's huge. Um, next question. Oh, over there. Hang on. I'm going round the back, and then uh, you'll, you'll be next. Hang on. What's the latest on the Venus phosphine discovery, and is there a consensus forming around whether there is or isn't? Oh, that's Very a, good. That's a hot topic, that one, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, one of... My old lecturers at Cardiff University was one of the PIs for the JCMT 850 micron data. So there was ALMA data, so that's the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So that's uh, the bunch of different radio dishes out in the desert. And then they were also using um, the JCMT, which I think is, I should know this because I use data from this telescope in my PhD, but I think it's like, was it 15, 20 meter mirror, something like that? It's massive. So you're already getting old. I know. This is, this is, this is what aging does to you. Know. <laughs> and um, so then that is a, a far infrared telescope as well. And they were using data from that to try and detect this phosphine. So there was a big flurry not long after it was first released. And people say, oh, no, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Uh, so far, it seems to have been withstanding largely. There's been a bit of doubt over the JCMT data, but the ALMA data seems to be pretty solid. As I understand it, they were waiting for more data on the JCMT, but then COVID has kind of throw th thrown things like crazy, so they haven't been able to get the data as quickly as they like. Um, other than that, I don't know. It's kind of gone a little bit quiet, but then if they are getting new data and they're preparing a massive release, this is the calm before the storm that you would expect. So maybe it'll come back out later this year. But yeah, really good question. It's also been nice to see the way that science works on this as well, that you release something like this, peer reviewed, and then everybody else looks to try and falsify it. And of course, there was a big rush to do that initially. And it's kind of calmed down into the middle where there's evidence for it. There's evidence that, that contradicts it. 
And also one of the really nice things is that this also leads to the world's uh, space agencies to start thinking, we need to start looking at Venus a little bit more and bring out all those old wild theories about floating balloons through the atmosphere of Venus to, to, to gather up uh, samples. Um, and, you know, th there are even some private missions that are looking to go out there and go and gather samples. And, um, you know, this is how we learn and, and we, get, we find out for definite. Because we've got Veritas and Da Vinci Plus. Yeah, yeah. As I say, yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be a really exciting time for Venus, and I think it's, it's going. It's almost a race. I feel between that long distance discovery of the big telescopes looking for life and the race to find life in the solar system. We've got this sort of now as sort of internal race between Mars and Mars and Venus. Like which one is going to going to pop up first? Go, Actually, yeah, there's bacteria here. Well, there's, actually, there's a little microbe here. Um, that that's really really fascinating. It could be nothing. There could be absolutely nothing in the solar system other than us. But it's really exciting. One of the things that that really surprised me in your talks, I hadn't heard uh, that before, was about looking for evidence of the hydrothermal vents uh, in Europa. Was it Europa or Enceladus? Both. Both. I mean. That's something, you know, that when we find out uh, we get some signatures from JWST, if we do, that's really exciting as well, because, of course, you need that heat source and that nutrient source on the, on the, the, the ocean bed. Uh, as, as we think life existed and, and started on Earth for life to, to form under those oceans of Europa and Enceladus. And, you know, that's another place that potentially we could be, you know, just put in higher in that ranking than, you know, at the moment it's like Mars, maybe Venus. But, you know, it may well be that, you know, Enceladus and Europa just jump over the top of those if we start finding evidence for hydrothermal vents on, the, on those ocean floors. Do you know what I think they should do? Mission to one of them, or both of them, just send a probe and it just contains like a hundred tiny little probes. They just throw them at the surface, hope that a few trickle down into the cracks <laughs> and go underneath. And just they just kind of, you know, just do a little bit of, you know, measuring composition, measuring temperature. And then if one of them gets eaten, then that's, you know, pretty sure <laughs> evidence. <laughs> of that's like, compelling yeah. evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on, let's, uh, do you know what, let's have a vote. Let's have a vote. I often wondered, like, what people think. Do you think we will find life in the solar system or outside the solar system first? So let's, let's go. Let's go. Option A, we'll find it in the solar system first. Who thinks we're going to get it? In Mars, Venus, the moons of Jupiter kind of idea. That's about half, isn't That's it? Uh, and all on the left-hand side as we're looking. Yeah, it's interesting. And me. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, and Jenny. And then, yeah. hands up, you think we're going to find it outside the solar system, round on an exoplanet, round another star? And there's a few that are not sure. They're, they're, and, and what about ones who think they just aren't going to find life anywhere? <laughs> oh, there's always yeah. one, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think there's three or four there, yeah. Yeah, what, 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 what's your it's, it's, it's an opinion? Well, I mean, finding life soon, I don't think, is an option. Certainly outside the solar system. I mean, we may find it inside the solar system soon, but I, I, I can't really see it. I guess it's also... I think, uh, sorry, I still think it's a long way down the road. It's, there's a lot of optimism at the moment with soon, but I think it's still a long way off. Yeah, and of course, finding evidence for it is not the same as finding life either. Yeah, yeah, that that's the thing actually. I mean, the, the, these telescopes might find methane and carbon and things like that, but whether that we can then say that's definitely life, it's just evidence for it, isn't it? Right, a question. We had a question was, here, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, right. was that a comment over there? Oh, go on. Hang on. We've got another comment. Hang on. If you found evidence of methane and carbon, how sure can you be? Is it hundred percent sure? No, because there's natural processes that can produce methane, but it depends very much on like the quantity, because I think methane is one of those gases which it needs to be constantly replenished. But it would depend on the levels, because based on Earth, you know, based on sort of volcanism and stuff like that, we can get a, a base level of, right, if it's about, say, this level, then it's probably just geological. But if it's a really high level, then no known natural processes can produce it. And then that's when it starts going into life. And this is the, the whole thing with phosphine on Venus is that although there are processes in Jupiter because of the extreme temperatures and pressures and the general Jupiter environment that naturally form phosphine on Jupiter, those environmental processes are not present on Venus, which is why when we saw the phosphine, it was like, oh, my God, we can't think of any known natural process that can produce it. But then, of course, it's the unknown natural processes. There's something happening 
on the ground or in the atmosphere of Venus that is naturally generating this phosphine that we just haven't understood yet. So detecting, say, methane is not necessarily ping, there's life. It totally depends on the planet environment, the, t the amount, if we can detect it varying over time, because if it varies, say, with, you know, what we think are seasonal cycles, that's a really big, like, woohoo, that's life if it's going with seasons. So, yeah, there's lots and lots of things to consider. O3, when I was studying planetary science, O3 was a big sort of candidate for, for showing life because, of course, it's ozone. Um, and ozone has to, it, it breaks down, breaks down very, very easily. Um, but it's actually more detectable than O2 at, at distance. So O3 was, is kind of the one that, that the big telescopes are excited by because it, it has to be replenished. So you have to have O2 to replenish the O3, and it doesn't last long. If, if O2 stopped, we stopped photosynthesis on Earth, the ozone layer would, would vanish very quickly. But the O3 is, is far more detectable than O2, so that would be a, a very quick one. I think I'm also right in saying, aren't I, Paul, that... Uh, O3 uh, isn't made by any geological processes no. either. No, exactly. So it, it would that would be a really big big indicator. Oh, there was a comment at the back. I'm, I'm, I'm hovering here to ask about. There's there's another comment. This is this is generating a a discussion. I like this. So it, it's a yeah related question rather than a specific comment that um, I did an astrobiology course years ago. And I I come from philosophy background, and my question was. Um, whether the things that we believe make up life, it, does that cause a kind of constraint in how we try and find life elsewhere? Are there, you know, if you mix other kinds of elements together somewhere else, that might be life, and would we notice it as life? I wonder what your opinions were on that kind of perspective. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the problem with hunting for life is we can only look for what we know to look for. If we, we don't know what to look for, we can't find it. So the only sort of life that we're ever going to be able to find is life that is similar to that on Earth. Because if there is, you know, silicon-based life or something, we would have no idea what the signals would be for that, how it would, you know, manifest in the atmosphere. So, yeah, the only sort of life that we're ever going to find is carbon-based Earth-type life, because otherwise it could be screaming at us and we just wouldn't know. But that's a really mm. good... Um, a good example of why I think philosophy is really important to include in these kind of discussions because we just don't know what's out there. We are so blinkered in our... I mean, we, we think as wide as we can, but we are always going to be constrained in what we know because of what we see around us. So we don't know what could be out there. And as Jenny says, if we don't know what we're looking for, we don't know uh, how to find it. Another question? It's a bit more down to earth. On the common last night was an EV scope. I don't know if any of you saw that and what you thought that thought of technology. The EV scope. Where's Graham? Where's Graham? There he is. Graham. Explain Gra it, Graham. Yeah, they're going to ask Graham. Explain what an EV scope is. That's all right. Look, put Graham on the spot. That's called the ladies in Grace Cat. Elevator music. <laughs> What's that called, Paul? That's called the Ladies and Grey Skirts. That, that's a podcast joke on our, right, when we we mess something up. Yeah. Well, I don't think it ever gets into the the uh, the actual podcast. It gets edited out, doesn't it? Are we are we there yet, Mr. Sound? Go for it. Okay. EV scope is uh, one of. A, um, a, a, a series of so-called smart telescopes. The other one is the Stellina. They both do the same sort of thing, though totally differently. It was best described by, to, by uh, somebody at my local astronomy club as a glorified instamatic camera, because to be honest, <laughs> it's, it is more of a camera than a telescope. Uh, the image that you're looking at, the photons aren't actually going into your eye. They're landing on a camera sensor. And then uh, you're looking at the image being formed on a screen. And some of the views that you actually get are, are absolutely stupendous. The downside, of course, is you're not really looking at the thing. You're looking at a picture on a camera. You should have seen John's face then. <laughs> right, thanks, Graham. What do you reckon, guys? EV topes? Yeah, it's a really interesting debate, isn't it? I've got to be honest. I mean, when you were looking at, I think it was the Whirlpool, and you know, everyone was sort of gravitating towards you to have a look at it, and I had a look, and I could not believe the view. 
through the telescope. It was mind blowing. Like I just, yeah, I was lost for words. It was astonishing. And I think they're really going to find their place, particularly in outreach, because when you're sort of trying to get people interested in astronomy, and sometimes you know they expect to see Hubble images. And it's not. You look at a galaxy or a I was, nebula. I was going to say it's it's the answer to that the Hubble problem in in amateur astronomy, isn't it? it it's that yeah. that uh, I I do lots of outreach with telescopes, and people expect to see that Hubble image. They expect to see the you know that that kind of the beautiful galaxies, dust lanes, and nebula. And you can't. You you don't see it. We would. I was discussing with someone. Earlier, I think it was, it was you. We were saying about the, what objects do you actually show people on on the street, and you sort of go, oh, well, there's there's the Orion Nebula, there's some open clusters, there's some globular clusters, the planets if they're up, the moon, and that's kind of it because anything else actually takes practice to look at. Um, it's that I have to remind myself, I use my left eye sometimes just to remind myself how difficult it is to look at some of these faint fuzzies, which you then point at someone and then they go, well, I think I can see it. And then you, you use your other eye and think, oh, yeah, actually, that, that's really difficult to see. This is the answer to that because it was spectacular. I saw the Sombrero Galaxy appear before my eye last night look, looking through that EV scope and it was just incredible now yeah I think I'm, I'm with John a little bit <laughs> the the visual astronomer in me and the, the, the sketch is going like <laughs> but it's incredible and for outreach just and the fact they went to a pad as well so you, you had this you know bigger screen that you could see and you could, you could see it appear that was it wasn't just an image that just kind of sprung up as well what I liked was that it, it started there was nothing, and then it slowly built the pixels up, and it, it was, that was interesting as well in its own right. So that, I, I like it. I, I think it's a great scope. What do you reckon? Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic piece of kit. I was just blown away when I saw it, just taking a look through the eyepiece for that very first time and seeing what, what was there. Um, are there any children here? Yes, there are. I, I was I was just thinking, blimey. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was that was really, really impressive. And, and you know, you... It's a paradigm change in um, in in amateur astronomy. You know, there's been nothing like this before. Where um, coming back to the outreach side, I, I always use my my wife test when it comes to to outreach. What is going to impress my wife if she looks through the eyepiece, not caring a jot about astronomy, and the only thing that she really cares about are the things that are big and bold in the scope. So maybe the rings of Saturn or the um, uh, the craters of the moon. And I, and I'm always when when I'm showing people views through scopes for the first time, what I want them to do is be really wowed by what they see rather than them thinking nah, there's nothing like I've seen before with Hubble images um, and then maybe being put off the hobby whereas with that you know that is you know four second images being stacked right in front of your eyes building up a picture that a galaxy is just as impressive more impressive maybe than um, than, than looking at the planets uh, I think it's a wonderful tool of course there's gonna be a lot of people that just think that um, seeing it on an image is not their thing because if they're getting a telescope, they want to actually see, want to know that those photons are hitting in their eyes. Um, so there's, it's going to be horses for courses, but being able to set something up in five minutes and then, you know, within a minute, have a wonderful image that's been created of any object you want and be able to just move around the sky like that. What's not to like about that? I think it's a fantastic piece of kit. And even though three grand's quite expensive for it, I think for what you get him, I don't think it is that expensive really. I was just going to say, um, how much do you think this is going to affect traditional astrophotography? Lots of people with four or five figure <laughs> scopes are going to be going, I can get just as good a picture out of one of those, especially as the technology improves. I don't think it will affect it that much at all because I think a lot of people that are engaged in astrophotography love the process of it and the art artistry of you know what they're doing with the levels and the curves to be able to bring out their images themselves and the, the process of taking them. So I don't think it will affect it that much. I, I, think, I think astrophotography will go like vinyl. It'll be like vinyl. It'll be the, there'll be the people who go like, yeah, it's vinyl. It's all about the vinyl. It's all about the records. It's all about collect, you know, nice turntable and the rest of it. And everyone else who wants to do it goes, yeah, I'll just download it. So you think it'll, it'll just, the astrophotography will be less for, left will, for the purists? It will get want more to, niche. Yeah. The astrophotography will still be there, in the same way the music's still there, but most people will drift towards, as these scopes come down in cost and they get they get even more advanced and, and easier to use, people will move to that. And then you'll have your niche vinyl experts who go, oh yeah, no, 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 it's all that. The same way I do the visual stuff and it's you know sketching, that's what everybody used to do you know, 200 years ago. <laughs> and, and I'm the gramophone, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> But it, it's that is it drifts, it drifts, and so actually I reckon it will. That's probably a little glimpse of the future. 
in the same way cameras, you know, normal cam- camera phones, things like that, people don't buy DSLRs and things well, like that. Well, even though I'm arguing the other side of the argument, I would absolutely ditch my imaging rig yeah. <laughs> for that. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that, that there is there is a thing that, you know, we've all ditched our kind of everyday cameras for the phones on our, you know, the cameras on our phones. Uh, and I think it'd be like that. It'll be that, that drift. Just a comment, really. I mean, vinyl left. We all got CDs, but now a lot of people are rebuying vinyl. Yeah, well, you, 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 yeah. You're, yeah, well exactly. I think that's the purest argument, isn't it? Yeah, that you yeah. know, you've still got some people that want to do the the old the old way of doing things because uh, they see it as better. But that's going to be a smaller audience, isn't it? Yeah. And then, you know, oh, four grand instead of three. Yeah. Uh, I bet Graham got it on the cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're we're talking about <coughs> expensive telescopes, which are wonderful and they produce amazing images, but. One of the things I love about AstroCamp is it's really, really friendly for beginners. And I was wondering if each of you could give your advice of, of for people starting out. Because it's scary as a hobby and you get a telescope that you didn't quite know what you wanted to buy and it, you can't work it and you get frustrated. So what do you think, not just for starting out the kit, but kind of how to help, what are your advice for beginners to kind of keep with it and get that resilience to stay with astronomy? That is a fantastic question. So I kind of fell into this trap a little bit when I was first starting to get into proper astronomy with my dad. I mean, so our telescope that we've got with us, we've got a 9.25 Celestron, and we've had that now for about 10 years or so. And we thought, right, we'll jump straight in, we'll get like a good telescope, we'll just like gun for it. And we bought it and we had it six months and we literally couldn't get it to work. Wouldn't point to anything we wanted it to point to wouldn't do anything we were getting really frustrated and then we were coming to the first astral camp and we said right we can't get it to work at this astral camp that's it we're just going to pack up and then we came to the astral camp someone had exactly the same telescope as us and then they showed us how to use it i mean the biggest problem was the fact that we weren't pointing it north so <laughs> but i mean these manuals that the advanced telescopes come with they may as well be written in a different language they're horrible for beginners so uh, yeah i remember my 127 mac that i got and the the manual that comes with that is, is, was just terrible it, it, yeah. it didn't say anything yeah it was just guesswork you just you just sort of yeah sort of, yeah played around with it until <laughs> you got it to work or not so i think if i was starting again i would probably go for binoculars or a very small telescope that's got you know a wide field of view practice actually learn in the night sky a bit because I had no knowledge of the night sky and I think that would have probably helped me a bit more if I'd actually known the basics. And then I would, if I wanted to kind of take a little bit more seriously, you know, see faint objects, see more of the deep sky stuff, I would get a big telescope and I would come to a star party because the knowledge, the collective knowledge of people at a star party is it's just, there's nothing like it. You can watch all the YouTube videos you want and you can read all of the books you want, but there is nothing like people out in the field helping you, pointing out new bits of kit that would take you 20 hours to Google and find. But yeah, uh, there's a lot to be said for a star party when you're trying out the, the hobby and trying to get into it. Yeah, and I would say that before you even buy a telescope as well. I think it's really important to find a community of people that you feel welcome in. And, and, and that's part of why we started up the Bake Street Irregular Astronomers in London and why we started up Astro Camp, because we found there was a lot of astronomical societies and a lot of star parties that just weren't that welcoming and friendly. And we wanted that community where people do feel that they're comfortable coming on their own, but also that they can learn a lot, because it's so easy to get put off by communities that aren't friendly in a hobby that's really difficult so I, I would say uh, get to know a friendly astronomical society that you can go to regularly and look through lots of scopes because that's that's mm. that's the really exciting thing just looking through different scopes and it really helps you before you pick a scope as well for yourself to buy knowing uh, the views that you're going to get through different scopes so that you're not either got something that ends up being too heavy for you and you can't carry it around or something that's too small and it doesn't wow you when you look through it I, I think yeah my my tips are always sort of know what what it is you want to do with astronomy i think a lot there's, there's quite a few people who just go straight into it and they're actually not sure what they want to look at they just want to look at the sky and of course when once you get into astronomy you realize that there's different telescopes for different jobs and different different to kit for different jobs and you know different mounts for different jobs um and so it, it's first of all what do you want to look at do you just want to do a little bit of astronomy and look at the moon and the planets and you know the brighter objects and you're like, well there, there's nice easy scopes to do that with or do you want to do astrophotography and things like that? And that, you know, it's a whole nother level. 
And then the biggest tip I have is where you're going to store the thing. Because most of the time you're not going to use it. I hate to say that that's uh, so people say to me, "Oh, what telescope should I buy?" I'm like, "Right, well, how big's the cupboard you're going to put it in? Because that's otherwise it's going to become a clothes horse in your conservatory, um, because there's nowhere else to put it, um, and that's really important because if you don't know where you're going to store it, it could be a really big cumbersome thing that eventually you'll just flog because you keep tripping over it every time you you try and walk out the dining room. And so I think this is why binoculars are greatly underestimated. You can do so much with a good pair of binoculars and then just a little camera tripod that you can screw into the bottom and just sort of manually move it around. And they really don't take up that much storage space. And lots of people have got tripods knocking around their house, you know, from even from years ago or presents that they didn't want originally. And now look at it, it's, you know, coming into its own. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for a good pair of binoculars and a camera tripod when you're starting out just to try things out. Or maybe just not even having your own kit. I've had telescopes for over 10 years and I still don't know what kit I want or whether I've got the right kit now I, I, it just changes on the breeze right another question over here hang on oh. Sorry, at risk of bringing the mood down how do we think wars on earth are going to affect uh, space cooperation oh. what a good question <sighs> thank you and good night yeah. <laughs> There's a popular podcast available on iTunes um, that uh, we had a discussion on this, didn't I th I think, we? I think we did. Yes. Um, that's a really... It's interesting because we had an American astronaut just land in a Soyuz capsule. So um, on a obvious kind of the evidence so far, not everything's gone to pop. You know, they, they brought an astronaut back from the ISS. There didn't seem to be any issues with that. Um, the ISS hasn't ended. That's all just all working fine. Beep, 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 beep. Breaking news. Breaking news. Oh, go on. Uh, oh, while go on. we were, while we've been here, Russia have announced that they will no longer cooperate on the ISS. Oh, you're kidding. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is why you asked the question, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, ambush. Yeah. So I, my internet wasn't good enough to kind of get the full details, but yeah, they're not going to just stop. So it's not, you know, the ISS is not just going to crash land, but they're going to phase out. Uh, but then their contract ends in 2024 anyway, and they were never going to necessarily renew their contract. So Russia kind of phasing out the ISS is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's an interesting one because they can't just disconnect from the ISS. It's not possible. It's far too integrated. Um, and if the other members actually wanted to basically take control, they could. And there's there's almost nothing that could stop them. They they couldn't shut it down or anything like that. Um, it's far too integrated. They're, all this talk of the Russians being able to disengage their modules and fly them off into the sunset that that's nonsense. They they it's just not possible. Um, it's far too integrated for that. So, and then yeah, tied up with that is that actually the ISS was it, it was kind of on its last legs anyway. We're only we're looking at the last few years and. A few couple of months ago, before the war, we were talking about 2030. It was being extended to, but that was all sort of possible. There's money for it. A lot of that was the transition over to private use of it as yeah, well, anyway, exactly. wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I can still see that happening. I can still see that happening. And and you know what 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 are the, to be honest, you know, what the Russians going to do if the rest of the the Q2 want to keep using the ISS? Come and take the module. Um, if you're going to be belligerent <laughs> about it. Um, but yeah, so I don't I don't know what the answer is. I mean, there's been all sorts of other issues, haven't there, about ExoMars and things like that, which we've talked about before. Um, yeah, so the latest on the Rosalind Franklin rover is that it's ready to go, and they are now looking for a new launch system for it. Um, hazy on whether they're looking for a new lander yet or not. That hasn't been totally confirmed, but they are actively looking for a new launch system, so... It's yeah. As soon as they can get it, they probably won't launch in September. It'll be the next Mars window, so that's 2024. But you know, collaborations break down all the time in astronomy, and well, with any business, collaborations break down, and you just take the collateral damage, and then you just carry on and find a new path. So, what it does open up is avenues for new collaboration with new nations, and and you know, ones which are just starting on their spacefaring journey. So. Although the landscape of space exploration will change, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be for the worst. 
Yeah, although I do have a sneaking suspicion that Rosalind Franklin might not launch now. I'm just starting to think that the window is slipping and slipping and slipping to the point where uh, it's, I mean, it's already becoming obsolete as time goes on. It's already, we've missed a couple of windows already, haven't we? I will say that James Webb was supposed to launch in 2007. <laughs> yes. And they still launched that That's 14 very years good late. So I reckon they will still launch it yeah, unless... I do hope so. I think what it may well what may well happen is they may combine it with the return sample mission for NASA. Yeah. I reckon that's possibly when it'll go up. So that's quite a few years ahead. But you know, the Rosalind Franklin is sitting there, they're preparing it for storage and so it, it's not gonna rust away or anything. So I think if it will go, I think that's the likelihood. Yeah, so if you weren't familiar with that, the, the next phase of the Perseverance rover that's on Mars, that's storing samples, really interesting samples from Mars for an as yet developed launcher lander system to bring it back to Earth. So that's what Jen's talking about, that that may be incorporated with the uh, Rosalind Franklin ExoMars rover that's um, getting delayed at the moment. Sorry, just uh, following up on, the, you were saying, what could the Russians do? They can't detach the, the um, ISS, but couldn't they like drill a wee hole in the hull and- <laughs> Again. Again. Uh, yeah, is is there not the risk of sabotage, I guess, if one's being paranoid? Well, well, there's the risk of sabotage, but they've already sabotaged it. So, you know, that, that's not affected by the war, really. Well, it, it may may escalate because of that, but yeah, there's always that risk there. I would say my, my, I think I would say escalation would be the problem there because technically uh, the, uh, the American module is, uh, is American sovereign territory. The European module is European sort of owned sovereign territory and the sovereign probably the wrong word for the the European Space Agency but uh, the Japanese module certainly Japanese sovereign territory so there's, there, and there's all sorts of treaty there so actually if they deliberately sabotaged it that would be actually a massive escalation um, which would op be a whole new world of what would happen next it'd be interesting though that's a declaration of war it would be it would be um, because yeah the, those American modules and any any like the Canadian arm is, Can is Canadian it, it, it belongs to Canada so it, it would be a direct um, question of sovereignty and ownership and things like that so that would be a very dark question to explore unfortunately ah, I see what you mean but they do drill a hole in the rush but yeah if it affects the other modules though that's yeah, it's a very, very interesting um, discussion, that one. I don't know the answer. Don't know the answer. Yeah, just being shown a BBC article about the Mars rover, and uh, in it, it says that it can be parked for a decade and still be used quite happily. So, not that, totally. That takes it beyond it its expected lifetime anyway, now. Yeah. <laughs> I know how much they're paying for this storage locker now to keep it in. Next question. Another comment. If the likes of SpaceX take over the ISS, is that going to be the death of independent science? Oh, well, there's a question. That's, all, that's, 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 that's an interesting question. Death yeah. of independent. Is there such a thing as independent science? So there's always like funding throw, from throw somewhere. That out. Yeah, I, I would argue there's no such thing as independent science because it's the 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 funding comes is is decided upon by policy and politics and you know the, the flavour of the day. So I don't think there's anything such thing as independent science. So in Although some, it is some respects, some uh, a private industry might be more independent science because they do the independent science they want to, not the science directed by whichever party is in control of the funding pot at that point. But it is nice having papers that don't say sponsored by McDonald's yes, <laughs> <laughs> along the top of the title or so on. But then this is the way that we're moving right towards commercial space and, and so on. You know, it is the inevitable way, really, because they've got the money, they've got the freedom, they're not bound by, you know, replying to the taxpayer about where all the money's gone. And it's, it'll still be good science. You know, lots of industries do great science it's, it's not all done in university but i think it, it will change the way that science is done i think losing sort of the the largely independent international space station you know there will always be motives now behind whichever company is sponsoring the 
whatever research is happening. But then, you know, does it leave NASA and ESA available to get us to Mars, to, you know, do missions out to the planets, which, let's face it, the corporate companies don't care about. They care about the low-Earth environment, how they can make money and how they can impact life on Earth. They don't necessarily care about going out to the ice giants and doing all of these great, fantastic missions. So by handing over things like the ISS to corporate companies, does it free up the budgets? Possibly. Well, I think uh, the, the, the main reason for the commercial crew development program, I think it was called, that, that was set up uh, 10, 15 years ago that, you know, brought out all of these uh, these private space companies. Um, the real aim of that was just to make them a lot more cheaper because they're agile, more agile companies than the, the defense companies that have always got the contracts for, whether it's the big spacecraft, so Northrop Grumman, uh, the second biggest defense company in the world, built James Webb Space Telescope, and Boeing built a lot of the, 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 the launchers. Um, and the whole point is to try and make it a lot cheaper. And we've certainly seen with SpaceX, uh, Bezos' company hasn't got there yet, but we've seen with SpaceX that they've really brought down the cost of access to space, and their biggest customer is still NASA and the D US Department for Defense. So things haven't really changed in terms of, um, of whether companies, these newer companies, are actually um, changing the dynamic in space. What they're really doing is just replacing those older companies that are more expensive because they're more risk averse and they're, they're bigger companies. Um, Musk's plans are still to get his starship to Mars. He wants to go to Mars and that seems to be almost the end goal that he's really rushing for. But then, you know, in his presentations, he always talks about, you know, it does give the options to go to any hard body in the solar system. Um, and having that capability, especially if it's at any cost price close to them, to what Musk's um, uh, advertising and hoping for, then that will mean that there's just so much more taxpayer dollars that are able to go into space exploration because you've got a launcher and you've got a lander there that can get you those payloads to whatever body you want to send them to. That, that in a sense, is a good thing. Of course, there is the other side of Starlink and everything else um, where it's purely for profit. But um, in terms of space exploration, Although it's a hope and a prayer at the moment on Starship, again, that's another paradigm that potentially, you know, we could be looking at NASA being NASA and ESA and JAXA and all the others being able to do so much more in terms of planetary exploration in the next 20 years. It's time for the last question. So it better be a good one. No pressure. Yeah. When we've sort of released exoplanet lists, there's a lot of Neptunian and sort of sub-Neptunian planets in the catalogues, but we've only ever sent one probe out to our own ice giants. What does that leave us in terms of a gap of our understanding of planetary evolution and, and mechanics, and what's it going to take to actually get out there again? Did Paul put you up to this question? I was going to say, this sounds like a Paul <laughs> question, doesn't that, it? That's it, that's it. That's my Uranus probe question, that is. There it is. Um, do, one, uh, do I want this one? Of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is. It's a huge hole in our knowledge of the solar system. Um, exoplanets have really surprised um, the, the, the planetary scientists about what, what planets they've seen. Uh, of course, starting with the hot Jupiters, which were the kind of easiest ones to find in many ways. So it was unsurprising they found those when we sort of look back with hindsight. But their existence wasn't predictive. This, these huge gas giants right near their star that that wasn't nobody thought that would happen but we just thought everything would be like our solar yeah system. exactly um and because uh, our solar system seems logical there's there's those rock rocky ones near the sun there's you know the, the kind of ice line then there's those gas giants where in the middle of the accretion disk where there was the most stuff and then there's the ice giants a bit further out where there was less stuff but it's colder and things could accrete more with the ices and that all seems very logical and so we assumed that systems would be pretty much the same give or take and they've not proved to be that at all. In fact, there's a whole other class of planet, which you're saying about these sort of mini Jupiters and um, I'm sorry, mini Neptunes and things like that, that and super Earths, where they, it's sort of planets in between planets in our solar system. They're, they're sort of when we think back, we think actually the rocky planets are quite small, and then the next ones are really big. Yeah. Actually, it makes sense. There might be ones that are in between. Um, so yeah, and then the problem is we've been to Neptune and Uranus once. Really, really briefly. Whiz pass. Whiz pass, took some <laughs> pictures, few little readings, and then off we went. With 1960s technology. With 1960s technology. And and it was fabulous. And I, I remember it. I mean it was it was back in the eighties. It was it was when I was, you know, at school getting interested in, in space and astronomy. So it was really exciting to see the Voyagers race past these things. But that was years ago. 
you know, I was in primary school. The New Horizons <laughs> has compounded it as well, hasn't yeah. it? Because now we've gone out and seen Pluto as well. It is literally a gap in the solar system because yeah. we've explored further and we've explored closer and now we've just got these two really significant worlds in our solar system that we just know very little about compared to the others. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we know we know very little about things like Uranus. We don't we don't know why it's on its side. Uh, we we don't know why things like it gives off more heat than it should and things like that. There's, there's all sorts of weird mysteries about it that we, we and we can't answer them from here. And what we need is a Cassini type mission or a Galileo type mission, which are the, the two missions really opened up Jupiter and Saturn. Um, that you spend that long time in orbit around those planets, answering those questions with some serious data. There's nothing on the horizon at the moment about sending a, a Uranus or Neptune probe. The real reason is they're so far out. Pluto got a, sp- a special case because it was the one we hadn't visited and so it completed the set and we wanted to go and see it um so that that got a, a, a sort of special buy on that one but actually they, this is this is something we need to visit and and put some put effort but it's money and time and i think you'll get you know government minister looking at the the kind of costs and time of these these missions go well yeah it's really expensive and I will probably be dead before that happens, so I'm going to get no kind of glory or or payback from this mission. Whereas you know Galileo and things like well, a, a much more short term. You, it's within well within a human lifetime. But actually, putting a Uranus mission together, you start now. It's not going to launch for years, and it won't be there for years. It, you know, potentially the people who sign off on it won't see it happen, and people are reluctant to do that a lot of the time and there is something to be said as well for what popular opinion is saying at the minute it's like you know jupiter and saturn they already are very exciting to the general public you know people like looking at saturn they like looking at jupiter they care about them people don't care about uranus and neptune and you know popular opinion does sway what happens professionally you know and we should care about uranus and neptune but you talk to people and they, it, it, they're the planets that evoke the least response, you know, because it's like, oh, Jupiter, the biggest planet. Yeah, cool. Saturn's got those rings. Yeah. Mars, it might be life. Ooh, Venus, isn't that the really hot one? And then, you know, again, Mercury is one of those ones which kind of loses interest, but then it has the honour of the closest to the sun. And then, yeah, Pluto, everyone's like, should be a planet. So, obviously, that gets all of the opinion. <coughs> And yeah, then Uranus and Neptune are almost. And then there's the one about. that sounds like a bum, and the one no, we know nothing about, and you can't really see. And that, yeah, that that is really the answer. It's money, time, and lack of interest, which is a real shame because you're right. That that it kind is. of what we see with exoplanets, it suggests we really need to look at these planets that are bigger than Earth and up to the size of Neptune. They're that missing kind of part of the solar uh, story, and. Yeah, we don't know much about them. And also think about how exciting Jupiter's and Saturn's moons are as well. Well, there's a hell of a lot of moons around Uranus and Neptune that we know very little about, and we don't know what exciting processes are happening there either. And I bet you there's way more moons than we've discovered. Yeah. Because, you know, Jupiter and Saturn are uh, sitting at like 80-odd, and then what yeah. are Uranus and Neptune? I think uh, they're, you know... 14 and 27, aren't yeah, they? They're, far they're so below. Yeah, and... And Triton, I mean, Triton itself is a really, really interesting, really fascinating body. It's, it's going right. It's not. A, it's clearly not a moon that formed around Neptune. It was a captured body. It's huge. It's almost the size of Pluto. Um, really, really, but we know nothing about it. So, yeah, uh, it's <laughs> difficult. Difficult to sort of <laughs> answer that beyond this. There's nothing you know that will happen probably um, for a very long time. I, I, d- I doubt I'll ever see a Uranus or Neptune mission in my lifetime. But there should absolutely be one. That should absolutely, absolutely. Be. Right then. Finish on a high, why not? We'll finish on a high. There we go. That brings us to the end. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very much, Thank guys. You. Thank you. No swear words. Well done. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Kept it clean for the kiddies. <laughs>